Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Penn State Technology Club. My name is Ray. Our guest speaker tonight is Jeff Carroll. Uh, he will be running a work, uh, Wireshark workshop. So if you're going to be participating, you probably want to have Wireshark open. Um, Jeff, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and then you can get started? Sure. Thanks, Ray and team and everybody for the uh, opportunity to come talk about one of my favorite techs, technologies, and and have a good time and um, taking time out of your evening for it. I am a, a tech instructor. I've been a networking instructor for about 32 years. I've been uh, working in and around protocol analysis for just under that 30, 31 years. I've been working with Wireshark and its predecessor Ethereal for 15, 16, 17, something like that. However long Ethereal has been around in the early 2000s and then renamed to Wireshark. Uh, and just kind of all about networking. Uh, currently I work for Hewlett Packard Enterprise as a network and big data instructor. I do some course development and this is not about my day job. So <laughs> we'll kind of say that's where I'm at, but um, I just have a lot of fun with networking. I very specifically are probably into Wireshark. I was commenting a little bit earlier, uh, upwards of three, at least three times probably a week, I've got it for open for some reason. Uh, I was working with it yesterday. We were trying to troubleshoot some IPv6 and Ansible uh, uh, things not working. And so it's like, okay, proof's in the pudding. Do the packets live? Nope, the packets aren't showing up correctly. So, you know, it wasn't very long and it wasn't for uh, trying to necessarily solve the problem. It was just more for uh, packet validation or, or traffic validation protocol validation. And that's probably what a lot of my use of Wireshark is, is just trying to validate what I think is happening on the wire or what I think should be happening. Is it happening on the wire and or trying to understand some bit of protocol. And so I've got to get it, look at it and dive into it. And so I, I uh, like I said, fairly in it fairly regularly and have a good time with it. So tonight is kind of a, I'm going to call it a little bit of a Wireshark, maybe 101, 201 kind of combo in, in fairly quick time. Um, one of the things I thought I would ask is if you've got your participant panel open, you can actually like raise your, might be able to raise your hand um, and kind of looking to get an idea who, who uses Wireshark. Put your hand up if you use Wireshark or any other protocol analysis tool. Um, uh, at any time, maybe not very frequently. So it looks like we've got a few folks that have been in it. And depending on your, I would say your technology involvement, anything in IT, either you might need to be in looking at packets or somebody else may have done it for you, but maybe they forward you a trace file with the bit of info you need to be focused to and say, look, uh, we found the problem or we found the issue or we found an anomaly or here's just a bit of reference and, and the, you might receive a trace file and have to look into it. So um, is it something you have to be a master at? I would say no depending on your role and your function, but it's definitely, I would say something just about anybody in IT probably could or should be aware of the tool and at least have a little bit of an idea how to use it. Again, you may not have to use it very much. So you can go ahead and uh, I think click on your hand again, raise the hand and, and go ahead and quote, drop the virtual hand. That way if I ask more questions a little bit later on, we'll be able to check it. So that's kind of the plan for the night as they say. Uh, we'll go through here. So just a few little bits on, on technology, and then I want to kind of get a little bit more about Wireshark, point out some, some capabilities. One of the goals in my mind of using Wireshark is you're either trying to find the bad stuff or you're looking at the good stuff. And in either mode, it's one of those, you're trying to wade through a potential large amount of information if it's a trace file, or you're trying to wade through a live trace. And you can't, as they would say, necessarily process everything that's flying by. So even one of the best things about using Wireshark is being able to help focus on what you need to focus on. And that agreed is one of those things we just don't necessarily always know what that even is, the proverbial needle in the haystack. So 
a lot of what I want to try to show is how can you narrow down your field of vision with what you're being presented by uh, in Wireshark, Wireshark's mode and perhaps get you to what you need to see quicker. Uh, I'm talking seconds. Can I save you a few seconds here or there? But depending on X, seconds may make all the difference. So if we look at it from the OSI model perspective, we're, I would say, mostly focusing at data link network transport layer. And not that you can't see all of the layers, but those are probably the more common layers of where you might be working. Physical layer, whoops, I didn't mean to do that yet. Physical layer is one of those that we used to didn't have to worry because it, it you know, either your lights were on or not, or the ports were energized or whatever. Uh, now, physical layer also involves wireless, and we are doing tons and tons more wireless troubleshooting, and quite often, not the TCP or the IP part of the wireless traffic. We're all, we're, you know, at, at, at layer one, we're at the RF. And so there's those capabilities as well with um, Wireshark and the wireless cards. Uh, and you may get all the way up into the stack, okay? So I'm not going to say you're depending on your reference and, and um, I would say general work duties or, or functional duties, you might be. I'm more in the network, you know, I call it layers two, three, and four. That's predominantly where I uh, am focused most of my my work. But it's still kind of that understanding that, well, we potentially can get up there of course, if things are encrypted, if traffic's and payloads encrypted, well, we might not be able to see what we would like to see, um, but nonetheless, it still might be possible. Uh, quick little thing on uh, on this uh, uh, slide as far as well-known ports. These are not necessarily all of them by any stretch, but these are, I would say, at a kind of a day-to-day -day level, a couple of the ports that you're probably looking at as far as regular network traffic. Uh, when you get into special applications, custom applications, then they're gonna have their own port IDs and the whole bit. But it's just a quick little reference slide. The nice thing about this though, is that if I want to look at, let's just say DNS traffic, I don't necessarily have to know is that on UDP port 53 or TCP port 53, and in very specifically the case in like DNS, which flavor is it? Is it TCP or UDP? And which one is the default? When does it flip, et cetera, et cetera. So I can't just necessarily say, I wanna look at UDP 53, and will I get all of the DNS traffic? And the answer is you may not, because it's a dual typed protocol. But in the case of, of Wireshark, I can do things, and I'll talk a lot more about this later, called the display filters, and I can simply type in DNS. And Wireshark already has the base default definitions for DNS to equal UDP and TCP 53, as actually as well as a few others. So it's handy to be able just to do something like that. I'm looking for DNS traffic. I may not know what it runs on. I just know it's DNS. And so this becomes part of the, the ease of use capability that we get in Wireshark. One of the things that you generically, uh, I would say, need to know at least a base understanding and at least if nothing else, where to go get the rest of the details is about the headers. And we've got the IPv4 header, we've got IPv6 header that's coming up in the slide. But just the basic layout, you know, where is the information within the packet? Uh, this is the standard. Uh, if I don't see a value in a particular field, that doesn't mean there's anything necessarily wrong, but there's gonna be some kind of a value in every field, even if it's basically a, you know, a zero value. There's, there's always something there. So depending on X will depend on how much detail uh, uh, that you're gonna to have to go look at in these headers. Just a quick view of the V6 header, it's actually a lot uh, slimmer trimmer as far as uh, all the amount of fields, they kind of cleaned it up a little bit, made it a little bit easier to work with, uh, even though it's a, um, a, a different protocol. I wanna back up a quick slide and see if you picked up on the, the title slide where I said IP and then I'll put V4 in parentheses. Uh, literally up until I would say recent time, most technologists are referring to IP 
as you know the internet protocol, but it is actually version four as to what we're seeing. But it's just been called IP for years because that's I would say what a lot of us think we've only had. Um, and then why I specifically put this one as IPv6 header. Um, I'm not going to delve into v6 much more than just about a couple of highlight comments, but um, any more, it's almost worth trying to say I'm working with IPv4 or I'm working with IPv6. Those that don't know the difference will then ask, why did you say that? What do you mean? And now it becomes a learning opportunity to help get people to understand we actually have two protocols on the internet backbone. We have two protocols quite often in a lot of networks, but still we don't see everything converted or running IPv6 yet. It's still very large uh, an IPv4 kind of world. So a little bit about uh, Wireshark. We're not gonna install Wireshark now, but I'll just talk a little bit about it. And just again, kind of go through some of the basics to help you use Wireshark more than just firing it up out of the cardboard box, as I call it. While there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever, and tons and tons of technologists use Wireshark in that manner because they just don't get into it very frequently. So they don't necessarily need or feel the need to spend any extra time tweaking its viewing usage. Yet, in my humble opinion, those few extra minutes of tweaking might save a lot of extra time later on. Again, just trying to look through all this stuff. Go get Wireshark at wireshark.org. It runs on all kinds of different systems, way more than most of us think, uh, even on some of the older platforms that are out there. Uh, but it is a, a very cool tool, open source free. Uh, tons of, of different folks around the globe work on this. In fact, right now this week is the European uh, Shark Fest uh, conference, which is a Wireshark conference. Uh, we have one in the US in the uh, early summer, and then they've been having one in various locations around Europe in the kind of mid, early mid fall. Uh, developers go there, customers go there, users go there, and everybody uh, shares about using Wireshark, which is a large part. My apologies for that. Our shark operations, uh, one of the things that occurred about three three years ago now is I came to a common user interface library. Previously, while we had Wireshark on multiple platforms, it actually had a little bit different UI look and feel and operation. Uh, now it's a more cohesive. So if you've got multiple OS platforms and you're running Wireshark, if you switch from Windows to Linux to Mac, parentheses Linux, or almost any other platform, you'll, you'll see the same presentation, all the buttons are in the same place the whole bit, which is actually kind of nice uh, if, if you've got multi-platform environment like that. Uh, and we see uh, Wireshark running as an application, you can either be capturing uh, live traffic uh, and, and looking through it, or you can look direct from a trace file. And, and even more importantly, it doesn't have to be a trace file that was derived from Wireshark. Uh, Wireshark supports almost all the other different file formats of protocol analyzers that are out there. So you can uh, take one from a different product and, and read it directly into Wireshark. It'll convert it, uh, and then you can actually save it out into that. Uh, you'll hear things like the PCAP, you know, I need a PCAP file, uh, and that's the the extension uh, that Wireshark used to use. We now have one called PCAP NG, and it uh, allows for extra metadata to be saved into a trace file. I'll talk about that here in, in a couple of slides. So Wireshark's main view, if you fired up Wireshark, it may look similar to this, where you've got your uh, you know, standard application kind of layout. And really, we kind of focus most of our time in the three big panes with typically the, mo the, the larger of the three, kind of this top one is the, the packet lists, right? You see, you know, packet, packet, packet. And if it's a live trace, they're flying by. If it's is the packet detail. So if you click on a packet, you will get the detail and you can expand this out to completely navigate through the details. And then finally, the bottom section down here, labeled as number seven, is the packet bytes. And uh, this is where you get the uh, effectively the, the 
hex and ASCII details of the, uh, the packet that you're looking at. Now there's different areas up in here as well. I kind of went right past them, but you've got your standard toolbar, you've got your graphical toolbar, and there's another little section in here, number four, that's, it's thin, you can't make it bigger or taller or zoomed in or anything, uh, but it's the display filter bar. And humbly, uh, you might end up spending a lot of time uh, in using the display filters, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, and, and that's kind of where your, your um, uh, navigation is going to be for that. Uh, the other area I want to point down to is the far bottom and look at the status bar. And there's a couple of, of components down in here that uh, can be of interest. And again, a lot of this will I'll be pointing out uh, when we start looking at trace files where I can see how many packets uh, I've got in this trace file. I can see how many are displayed. Uh, in this case, this basically means I'm not running any kind of a display filter to look at something less than all the packets. And one of the other things I, I tend to focus on is in the far bottom right corner is your profile. And I'm gonna talk a, a more about that coming up uh, in basically a couple of these areas. One of the things that's really handy, and, and, and this is not necessarily uh, a specific Wireshark field, uh, uh, feature, but it is um, uh, one that, that some multiple different protocol analyzers have, is being able to color code types of traffic or types of packets. Some people love the coloring rule usage. Some people, uh, I would say, almost hate it. They, you know, it doesn't work for them. Uh, so one thing about coloring is that it's a one button click in the main Wireshark view. Turn it on, turn it off. It's on by default. The value of color rules is to be able to let colors help you determine if you see or maybe don't see certain kinds of traffic. If I look at this screen as I'm showing right now, I can tell a tremendous amount of information from just these few packets displayed of what went on uh, during just those packets, uh, you know, whether this was a trace file or a live capture, uh, I can tell a few things. I can tell it's a dual protocol environment. I've got IPv4, I've got IPv6. Uh, if I'm looking at routing protocols, I can see I've got OSPF traffic over here. Uh, if I'm looking for uh, IPv6 specific functions, I can see I've got router advertisement, router solicitations. I see some DHCP v6 traffic, all very specific types of v6 traffic that I would expect to see on a uh, properly functioning network that, that had v6 enabled. I can see this layer two traffic, link layer discovery protocol, which is basically the hardware device telling everybody on the network, here I am, and this is who I am, and bits about me. Uh, in older times, <laughs> in, in previous times maybe, um, we had Cisco Discovery Protocol as our initial one, and uh, Cisco effectively kept it to themselves, and so the industry came up with Link Layer Discovery Protocol. So they are basically um, mirror type uh, uh, protocols that we help uh, determine physical infrastructure devices on our network. And with this, if you can tell very quickly the different colors, uh, and maybe even if your color vision is different, then tweak the coloring the way you would like. Uh, in order to help you if you find it. For me, I can look at something like this and say, yep, where went a router advertisement? There went my, my red. Oh, there went a router solicitation. There went my pink, all right? And, and other particular colors that I may have in my packets. The other thing, if you look on the far right side, we got this uh, in early, um, actually, I guess in later 2X versions of Wireshark, but we got a color toolbar next to the scroll toolbar. And by this, I can also look and say, all right, I can see with those colors uh, how frequently some of that appears. And yes, it's not a, a granular type view, but it's still the view of, I can kind of tell there's some red in there. I can kind of tell there's some pink. I can see some yellow, some green. And so I, I could look at that and go, okay, I at least am seeing some of the traffic I would expect. And likewise, I could also color certain kinds of traffic 
that we'll call the bad traffic, especially if we've already identified certain types of traffic that are not proper on our particular network, I can uh, specifically define those colors. Uh, in, in that same kind of view of, if I see that, I want my eyeballs to say, there went that packet, even if it just goes scrolling by 15 pages later, I still could, you know, perhaps process that, yep, that's going on. Right. Setting up our colors, this is what the color rule definitions look like. Uh, uh, Wireshark's uh, pre-configured ones are pretty much from this area where we say that's bad TCP and down. In my particular view, I had created some of these other ones. And it's completely up to you, however you want to do it, uh, how you want to uh, define a color rule definition, how you want to uh, say what protocol you're wanting to focus on, how you set your colors. In fact, this is basically setting all of that up for a color rule. And then Wireshark processes these top down. So it's just like a firewall rule or a router ACL. The first time Wireshark says, say, oh, they went an ICMPv6 type 134. I don't have to keep processing the color rule. All right, I found a match, done. Next packet, please. And this all happens on the fly. So colors perhaps can help you if if you're looking for certain kinds of traffic to either say, yep, there it was, or where is it, right? I didn't see this for a bit of time and I expected to. Why am I not seeing it? Well, maybe that's part of the whole problem if, if you're troubleshooting. Well, display filters is another one of these area that I, I, I spend a lot of time using. I spend a lot of time, um, I would say, preaching it, you know, telling everybody about it. And because there's a lot of folks, again, who just kind of use Wireshark in a basics way, which is totally fine, but this might enhance the use capability of Wireshark. It does for me. And this is a, basically the capability of saying I can define traffic that I either want to specifically see and only see while I'm in a view, or I can say I want to filter out traffic that I don't care about i.e. if I'm troubleshooting, let's just say an IPv4 and IPv6, you know, a layer three protocol issue. All right, let me back up to my trace right quick. If I'm troubleshooting layer three, I don't care about LLDP. Uh, so I could filter out LLDP traffic in that particular mode of operating. Uh, I may say that I don't need to worry about my routing protocols because I'm having other problems that, that that if I don't get those fixed, routing's not going to work anyway. So I can filter out OSPF. I can say things like, well, DHCP is not what I'm troubleshooting. So I could filter that out. So you can use the filtering capability as your logic to say, what do I want to see or what do I don't want to see? Or a hybrid of that. It could be, well, I want to look at a wide range, say from uh, a source address of this range, you know, a subnet and then only this kind, this kind, and this kind of traffic with that source address. And then that would effectively filter out everything else. Or maybe I wanna filter out this source address uh, range or, or single address and see everything else that's going on except for that. However you would like to use, to use display filters, um, this is what's gonna help, as I call it, narrow your field of vision down from all of that data that's flying past and help you say, okay, I've found what I'm looking for or I'm not finding what I, what I expect to be finding. And uh, the cool thing about these display filters is that you can save these definitions. And um, one of the ways that uh, we use display filters, let me back up real quick. I can either type in, if I know the details, and you can see some of these in here where I'm looking for, you know, HTTP response codes of 200, or I'm looking for DHCPv6 or ICMPv6 type 134, which I happen to know is a router advertisement. But let's just say I want to find a certain kind of traffic, but I don't know the details of it. I, I don't know this, all right? I can also be looking at a trace and go, ah, I wanted neighbor solicitation traffic. So I can literally click on a field down here in the packet details, uh, right click, bring up my menu, go to this apply as a filter, and 
in this case, I might say selected, and then that will create my filter, which I happen to know is ICMP V6, all right, which we see right there, ICMP V6, type 135. And so that would be similar to uh, this one here, even though this is 134, it's still ICMP V6 dot type equal equal 135. If you don't know even all that syntax, that's where being able to right click on a portion of the packet and say, this is what I want. And then you can see the rest of the logic in here and say, well, I want to filter it out. I, I, you know, I, I don't want to see it. I do want to see it. Or I want to add to part of my display filter, i.e., okay, I found the source address. I see everything for that source address, but now I need a source address with this type of traffic. And so this is where you can say things like, I want that and something. I want that or something. Um, again, you can play with the logic on that and build these filters to use. And then, um, oh, where did it go? Hang on, I got to find my, I don't have it. Uh, then you, I don't have this view here. I'll show you in a few minutes. Then you can save those display filter definitions because once you've uh, uh, configured one, or as I call it, dialed it in, once you finally said, ah, now I'm seeing exactly what I need to see, you may have a very complicatedly configured display filter. You don't want to lose it. The typical thing is you'd, you'd highlight it, copy it, paste it into a note somewhere, you know, to a OneNote or an Evernote or Notepad, whatever, so that you could bring it back up in the future. But you can also save it directly in Wireshark for recall at a future point in time. Another component that are back up to my main and you can uh, see uh, in this particular case, right, we've got X columns, we've got time, source destination, uh, you know, the protocol, uh, the size of that packet, and basically the info section. There may be times where there's pieces of a packet that you want to actually see as a column. Uh, if you're, say, working with VLANs and you know you've got um, 802.1Q uh, type packets of tagged VLAN, and you want to see what that VLAN has ID without having to look in the packet details. You could create a column for that. So same thing as we did with display filters. If I want to add a column into my Wireshark view, I can click down in the packet details, uh, right click, do as an apply column. It'll locate that column just to the left of the info. And you can move it across uh, the, the column layout. And then you can do things like adjust what the column is, where you want that uh, display information, you know, alignment, uh, change its name, etc. Uh, almost like you're playing in a spreadsheet, where you might change the, the, um, uh, the field definitions. So colors help focus display filters give you just the viewing of what you would like or not like to see columns provide some quick information right up front without having to look into the to the, the uh, detail area of a packet and you can use these combinations and then this is where i was getting to a little while ago i can save that view as what we call a configuration profile Configuration profiles are extremely handy when you need to have different view modes of different kinds of traffic. And if you remember uh, earlier when I was showing the main Wireshark screen in the status bar, bottom right corner, there's a profile area and you can click down there and you would get a listing of all the profiles that you've, you have. At default, there's a couple, literally. Um, after a while, you may say, well, I want to look like here, specific IPv6 traffic. The cool thing now is this will bring in my color rules, my display filters, and my column layouts, my Wireshark layout for viewing IPv6 traffic. 
Uh, I've got one in here for OpenFlow. I've got one in here for QoS. I've got one in here for some specific wireless. Uh, you can see some of these other uh, names in here. They were project-based uh, uh, configuration profile. And so if I was troubleshooting IPv6, I'm going to use my v6 main profile. If I'm troubleshooting uh, OpenFlow, then I'll use my OpenFlow. And that allows me to have the view, the Wireshark presentation of the information specifically geared to that functionality. The next cool thing about these are is that you can share this these config profiles. There's basically a folder for each one of these and within it a, a, a four, five, six files that represent the display filters, the color filters, the, the column layout that effectively what it takes. You copy that folder up to a shared drive, email the team, hey, I just pulled together this really cool based on our accounting application. It's got everything laid out. You don't have to tweak. You just click a few buttons and you know, there you are. Go get it, team. And Wireshark, whether it's Windows, Wireshark, Mac, Workshark, doesn't matter. It's all common. And there are a few repositories out there for uh, configuration profiles. Um, uh, one that uh, has been getting a lot of attention lately is up at um, uh, Cellstream, C-E-L-L Stream. Dot com. Uh, and you can just simply uh, use your favorite search engine to look for Wireshark configuration profiles. There's a number of folks that host those kinds of things out there. And so it becomes very, very handy to, again, focus um, your viewing on what's important to you for what you're doing. And you may not have anything yet. You may not really know yet. It may be take a while. What you see in this listing here is an evolution of at least, uh, where are we at now, 19, uh, seven years worth of, of accumulation of different projects, different things I've worked on over time. So, and, I, it, and it's actually bigger than this now. I, I, I have more uh, in my real wire chart. And finally, the last, I would say, key feature that I want to point out in, in base wire chart is this capability of of adding in what they uh, formally refer to as packet annotation. Uh, the, the, um, the, the shortcut to it is called packet comment. And so I can be on a packet, right click and select packet comment. And then what I can do is type in some just text that help me later on, if I wanna review this trace file, it could help me understand things that were going on. I can use this when I'm troubleshooting. I'm a network guy. As far as I'm concerned, the network is never the problem. It's always somebody else's. I'm gonna blame the server team, the application team, the desktop team, the bosses. I'm gonna blame everybody else because it's never the network. But I know categorically that I can't just say that with any authority and get away with it and be done. No, it's, you know, if everybody's pressing the go button and it's not going, it's the network. And if I find out it is the server team's problem, well, I'm gonna go find out why I think that, and I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna make a bunch of packet comments and say, here's why, here's why, here's why, et cetera, et cetera. And then I'm gonna send in the trace file and I'm gonna say, go put in a, a display filter called PKT underscore comment and then that will only show me all of those packets that have a packet comment. And there's all the notes that they might need. And that's a use case. Another use case is I tell folks to get traces of the good times on the network. Because how can you troubleshoot the bad times if you don't know what the good times are supposed to look like? At that point, you're looking for that needle in the haystack. You're just trying to find something that doesn't look right. So take a trace of the good times and make packet notes at milestone operations. Like here's the beginning of a client server transaction. Here are the certain milestones during that process. Here's the end packets, you know, the, the, the we're done of that particular type of a transaction. And make all those kind of comments, just like you might make notes um, about the application and how it works. 
make them in a trace file. And then when you're trying to troubleshoot, you can bring up this trace file, find out all these uh, packet that have comments to them, and then compare that to what you're seeing uh, at, during the problem time. By and large, most people don't do anything like that because why should I get a trace file of the network when it's working? I've got a million other things on my list to do today. I don't have time just to sit there and, and play with wires. Oh, but when there's a problem, you know, I might have to dig out where to start it out. So it, it's the investment to make notes like this. Uh, and this is where we, one of the big reasons why the packet extension or the, the Wireshark file uh, extension went from PCAP to PCAP NG is to be able to preserve this metadata information. Uh, there were other reasons as well. This was one of the biggest ones. Now, the fun thing about this is if you get a PCAP file, uh, if you do a save as on it to a PCAP NG format, then you'll be able to save, save made it, metadata to it. It doesn't change any of the rest of it. It just preserves this metadata. And so um, uh, it's a little trick. I kept trying to add comments on a PCAP file because I, I could type it in, but it would never save it until I, I don't even think I read it. I think I just kind of figured out, save it as a PCAP NG, and then you can make comments and, and save those for uh, later on. Um, sorry, I wasn't watching chat, but it looks like we're okay. So um, some of the key features, this is that, that building that display filter called PKT underscore comment. It's a, it's a predefined one. So all you have to do is type it in there and then you'll get just the packets that relate to embedded packet annotation. And then you can uh, go down in the metadata and look at it and say, oh, this is where Telnet started. And actually, I like this Telnet. I had different little milestones going through it and uh, as, a, as a reference point. And now I don't have to sit there and look at however big the trace is and try to find certain events packet by packet by packet. I already know what I need to be uh, uh, looking at at different points of time of, of an application's run. One of the other things that we can do with Wireshark is also use capture filters. So the display filter, it doesn't do anything except for what you're seeing. Uh, when you're in gen, uh, uh, default capture mode, you're gonna get all traffic that you possibly can. Doesn't mean you will always get all traffic. There's a whole nother bit of stuff that goes with that. But if, you, if you've got a good idea of the type of traffic that you need, you can also build this capture filter or build capture filters. And this is Wireshark's way of saying, as I see the traffic, I'm either gonna keep some or discard some. And I'll never even give it to you, Jeff. You don't, I, you've told me you don't need it, I'm not gonna give it to you. Uh, with that capture filter though, you will never get that traffic back. So if what you needed, just got discarded and you didn't know it until later, you might have to um, redo that capture again. And depending on your troubleshooting scenario, that may not be an easy task. I was on a project many years ago where there was a problem in the network. Um, it was sporadic. It didn't happen to any one or grouping of people at a time. It didn't matter time of day, day of week, didn't matter how loaded or unloaded the network was. It was completely elusive. And we spent finally about three days uh, gathering traffic from about a half a dozen points and we finally got the trace, the magic trace where we could observe the problem. And uh, it just took a long time, uh, but uh, understanding what was going on in the network was relatively easy to find out. And it actually turned out to be the application development problem because they were not using TCP for packet timing. They were using their own definitions and they were having latency on the network that they didn't expect. And so the application was having a problem uh, where if they'd left to let TCP have done the job. Actually, it wasn't the network, right? But it sure did feel like the network. So capture filters can be handy. I'm personally not as big a fan on capture filters. I would rather get everything I can and then filter out what I don't need. I'd rather uh, use my display filters. 
But again, there are times when I know very specifically what I need to get and I don't need anything else. And so I can, I can filter that out um, uh, right off the bat. I've got friends that they love capture filters equally. And so, you know, it, it's almost like what works best for you. That's really the nice thing about Wireshark. It's what works best for you. You know, everything that I'm talking about tonight is uh, largely my opinion, right? It's how I use it, how it works for me and my day-to-day -day usage of Wireshark may not fit exactly for you, but that's okay. Tweak whatever I'm saying, add it to your own experience, add it to everybody you talk to that uses it, and uh, you'll be awesome. So I made a quick little comment very, very flying past of capturing and where do you, where do you go to get traffic? And uh, largely it just depends, you know, where is the problem? Do you know where the problem is? Uh, where is traffic going? If I've got traffic going from node A to node B, I'm going through a router. If there is quote, a problem, which side is it on? Is it on the node A side? Is it on the node B side? I may not know that initially. So that means I probably need to be capturing traffic on both sides because the router, of course, is splitting it up. Uh, now it becomes, how do I capture that? Do I use uh, uh, Wireshark on the actual nodes themselves? Is it possible? Is that gonna cause um, a potential I would say issue in that maybe the problem goes away because you've installed Wireshark on there. And maybe just even that process took care of the problem. Uh, do you tap into a network? Um, uh, do you use span or mirroring of, of the infrastructure ports to give a copy of the traffic out? Um, there are pros and cons in all of these scenarios. Um, the, I would almost say most preferred way of getting capture data is kind of over here on the, the, the far side using an inline tap so that the traffic um, comes into this tap and is basically uh, forwarded to the intended receiver and a direct copy made, but it's a regenerative bit of electronics. So you're not, um, you're not gonna affect the original traffic. When you do things like spanning up a port to say, okay, switch, make a copy of the traffic that's going out port two and send that over to my, my port I call a tool port where I've got Wireshark hanging off. It's largely those activities are either run in software or in the ASICs in, in most more modern technology. Uh, but you could also say, well, I wanna span an entire VLANs with the traffic. Well, if I've got 21 gig ports, even running at 25% utilization, I'm still gonna oversubscribe my one gig port where I'm trying to send all 20 ports worth of traffic to. So spanning is not necessarily a, a great uh, operation. And again, if I run Wireshark on the, uh, perhaps uh, one of the effective machines, I may lose something. So you do what you can. Um, um, if you do anything in trying to capture data that disrupts the flow, however, sometimes that activity alone may quote, clear up the problem or uh, worse, make the problem more elusive, uh, i.e., oh, it looks like it's working and everybody shakes their hands and you know, claps and dances and says next ticket. And then a little bit later, the problem starts reoccurring. So those are always the risks uh, in, in getting traffic. Once you've gotten to the point of, let's say we're grabbing Wireshark or grabbing packets with Wireshark, you've got it all dialed in. There's a couple of, of key utilization areas of Wireshark that might be helpful. And I was just talking to a gentleman today. I was at a, a, a IEEE conference, a little local conference. Um, he uh, is a student working on a project. And one of the things he was looking at uh, on some of his traces were this very thing. He was looking for top talkers. He was looking for those addresses that are, that are having the bulk of the conversation or more conversations than others. Quite often you might find things uh, just even looking at this traffic, the top talkers, uh, like 10101, 10100 are both talking to 10100. And um, while that unto itself may not be exactly what I wanna say, I can also start to see though that um, 101100 and 10200 um, um, 
uh, my bad. Um, sorry, I lost my train. That didn't work out the way I wanted. Oh, wait. Nevertheless, we can see the top talkers if we sort this and see which addresses and, and to whom they're talking, and that's the most traffic that's going on. We might be able to, to say things like, well, maybe this 200 is a server, because uh, I also see the 200 later going out to public addresses. Uh, maybe that's the router. You know, I don't necessarily know just by looking at this view, but I can tell a few things. This is often one of the things I want to see. Who's talking? Uh, I may not even want to see it from the quote top talkers. I just want to see who's talking. And then I can sort this different ways uh, on all those different columns just to try to find out what's going on. Uh, often in uh, either in troubleshooting or validation, um, you just want traffic. You just want to capture traffic for a while uh, for whatever bit of time makes the most sense. And then that's one of those things. It just depends on that moment. Uh, and to be able to do things like this, I can't necessarily troubleshoot yet till I have a little bit more understanding. Let's just say when somebody says, well, it's not working, look like it's client server. Well, of course that narrows things down, but does that mean it's something on a client or something on a server? Not necessarily. So I need to get a little bit of idea of what's going on in my network. Uh, kind of following that thread may be, okay, we see who's talking. Now let's find out what's being talked, i.e. what protocols are being um, utilized on my network. And to a certain point, even broken down, we see V6, we see V4, we see link layer. So we can dive into this to say, okay, I'm seeing this kind of traffic and potentially make a I'm not going to say determination to the problem, but a determination at least what's going on or what's not going on. Again, the case may be that there isn't some communication happening and you're just not seeing it. This is a really, really quick way, again, of looking at the types of protocols that are running without having to scroll through a bunch of traces or research the protocol type uh, column uh, and still search through. We can very quickly pull up this kind of a view in Wireshark to say, okay, what all's running? Uh, yep, 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 okay. All the protocols that I think are running or that I think should be running are running or not. And maybe I can ascertain a little bit more information about it as to you know how much of the traffic in this trace uh, is the different types of protocols. That again, may, may quickly point to something that's going on. These are just a few of the wizards uh, that Wireshark has with some of the very common. Uh, another one is the follow the streams. Uh, you could literally click on, um, if you know the, who the first packet is of a sequence or almost any packet that possibly within that sequence, then Wireshark will bring all those up together and effectively give you things like a, a potential decode. Like this was the HTTP stream of retrieving a page. And instead of looking at every packet and trying to go find, you know, all the little bits of detail in it and finally find out a little bit about that web page, um, I can use this follow the stream, follow TCP stream or UDP stream or an SSL stream and get this analysis, effectively get the, uh, the basic data that's going on with that uh, particular uh, stream that might be there. Again, if I'm looking at a particular, uh, say, custom application, uh, this might show me what's going on as far as why is it maybe not working. Uh, oh, well, we, we see X occurred or we didn't see X occur. And, and okay, maybe that's going to help us better determine what's going on. You know, something like this. Well, I'm trying to get to a web page. Well, what's, what's being returned? You know, am I going to the right place? Little, perhaps little, little bits of info like that. So what I want to do real quick is just open up a trace file. And uh, if you went up to the GitHub site uh, to get that file, um, certainly feel free to open up and kind of follow with me. If not, you can get it later. So a couple of things I want to show real fast. This is, if you look down at my profile definition, let me just go and make that full screen. Far bottom, bottom right corner down here is my default profile view or uh, default, my profile which one I'm using. I'm using the Wireshark default out of the cardboard box. Humbly for me, 
I don't spend a lot of time down here in the bytes detail most of the time. I, I only need this when I'm finally down to the point of, ah, there's the packet or there's a grouping of packets. I, I don't need that. It takes up real estate. So one of the things I can very quickly do is come up here to view and just deselect the packet bytes. And now I get a little bit more real estate. I've got a lot of other things that I can do as well. Um, uh, maybe I want to uh, lay out. If I go to edit preferences, I may say, well, I want a different layout uh, instead of the, the three main views being uh, all uh, basically vertical. Maybe I want some side by sides. Uh, a, a number of, of folks that I know run in this second option, but you can sit there and lay out your, your Wireshark view. Um, I'm actually going to go ahead and put that back on because what I want to do instead is maybe bring up a different profile. Like I spend a lot of time in IPv6. So if you might have noticed, so let's do this. Let me bring back up that default. I've got no display filters defined up in here. Um, I have no extra columns. Um, I can tell you my colors are all at default. It, it's all, it's all at a default level and it would normally have this packet view. But if I very quickly select in that profile field, come up here and say IPv6, this now dials in. I've got a bunch of display filters defined up here. Um, I actually have a new column called Delta, Delta time. Uh, I don't have the packets byte uh, um, selected. So, uh, and I've got different colors, I just happen to know. So I can do things like scroll through and I saw red go by. Um, there's some more red go by. So those are the kind of things that help me very quickly. Um, if I want to say, well, is any of this traffic Telnet? I can just simply type Telnet up in the display filter. As I say, boom, Wireshark, if you look down here, as far as state packets out of 3,219 are Telnet. Yay, right? That just filtered out. And if you look at somebody's packet numbers, they're they were way down in the listing. I would have not, it would have taken me a while to scroll through to find telnet traffic. Uh, let's do DNS traffic. And now I can see just the DNS packets. There's 1,520 out of 3,219 that are related to DNS. Now this is what gets to be very interesting because I can look at some of this and go, well, yeah, that's DNS and that's DNS, but you know, why am I seeing some of this other traffic that doesn't actually look like DNS. You know, I see some just ICMP. And part of this is uh, gonna also be related to how Wireshark has been defined for DNS. One of the things I can do very quickly is come up here, uh, preferences, protocols, I open that up, go down to DNS. And here's Wireshark's definition for DNS traffic. UDP, TCP 53, as well as TCP 5353. And so I could, I could change this, I could add to it, I could take away from it. I can create my own as well. So that's where these, uh, using like these display filters is really, really handy. Look for SSH traffic. And I can see 92 packets of SSH traffic and on and on. Let's look at web traffic, HTTP, two packets. And it's, as they would say, it's that easy using these display filters to be able to look through and sort for traffic. Um, one of the things that you may want to do is get a little bit, um, I would say, more uh, um, uh, granular in your view and say, I want to look at ping for IPv6, uh, whether it's a request or a reply. And so I've got a filter that's just for that. So it's a slightly more complicated, I'm looking for uh, a type 128 or a type 129 in IPv6. Little things like that. Uh, I want to work at, look at just quad A DNS requests. And um, so I've got a display filter that does things just like that. Um, if I look at some of these others, uh, let's look at this one right here. Oh, he doesn't have any display filters. That, that wasn't good. I didn't have my, my stuff. Ah, here's a couple up here. Uh, there's that PKT underscore comment. Well, it doesn't look like this trace has any comments 
in any of its packets. So just maneuvering through these profiles gives me some, some varying options that I um, may want for you know, a particular view. Um, so that's one of the things we can see. Um, because I'm running really short on time, what you're gonna be able to do, the, this presentation will be up on that GitHub site uh, in a few days, give me a few days. The trace files are already there, but you can get these trace files. And then I've got these little mini labs, as you can kind of see here that you can go through and you can see, you know, I can put in uh, a DNS query name. Uh, a very specific looking view right here to try to find out what packets uh, I needed the workshop lab file. So let me go over here, open up the workshop lab file. While that's coming up, let's get that filter. This is how easy life is, as they say. I copy it, go into Wireshark, and let's see if we can paste it in correctly. If you manually type one or paste one in like I just did, you then have to hit this little blue arrow the field, and then that will sort traffic. And so this very quickly sorted through 435 packets to find two that relate to this very specific DNS query. Okay, and as they say, it's, it's just that easy. Uh, if we look at some of these others, uh, what we're looking for, well, which packet, or if we're looking for a, just the reply, what was the IP address in the reply? So these are some of the uh, uh, little, I'll call them lab scenarios that you get to play with and, and to help you perhaps down the road to utilize um, the display filter functionality of Wireshark uh, to perhaps look through. Uh, you get into this other lab file here, there's some other different protocols that, that to just kind of look at. Look at them by name, or you can type in longhand. Uh, uh, Wireshark has an interesting definition for RDP, um, and it's not what we would have thought, so you actually need to put one in. And so this is talking about how to add in uh, an RDP filter. Actually, let me just open, bring this back up. So um, here's another one that's really interesting where I want to go into a packet, but I want to go into a specific offset and look for a specific field. So uh, this part of the packet, http.user underscore agent, um, go 24 bytes into that packet or to that part of the packet and look at three bytes. And I'm looking for three bytes to equal this uh, string. And this is how I can look for very, very specific kinds of content within a packet, perhaps even all the way into payload if I have clear text payload that I can look at. So again, just a few little different labs. So a quick wrap, um, a, a couple of resources of information, you know, sample files. It's quite often one of those things you wanna look at something. I wanted to look at some VXLAN traces, oh, literally within the last month. Uh, something came up, it spurred my uh, interest and it's like well it's going to take me a lot longer to build a little lab with that has VXLAN traffic in it so I just literally um, search you know VXLAN PCAP and potentially can find something well now I'm going to go to one of these three sites because there's a lot of resources uh, that these folks uh, store up here as far as trace files uh, here's that cell stream uh, site that's got the different profile repositories uh, Varying people contribute. I contribute to the, some of these sites, uh, as, as I say, to, 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 just to be able to share. Uh, last little bit, where do, you get, where do you get training? Where do you get knowledge? And um, what I'm not gonna talk about, but there is, there's a Wireshark certification. Depending on where you are in your career, and depending on how important knowing and utilizing Wireshark is in your job, that might be of interest. Uh, if you're kind of early in your career and you're looking at a little bit of a differentiator um, and diving into packets is something you're not afraid of, and, but you want it to be more than just telling either your boss or a potential employer, hey, I'm really good at Wireshark and, and protocol decodes. And they're like, oh, really? Okay, fine, blah, blah. Yeah, and I've got a Wireshark certification because it is not a faint of heart. You've got to know protocols, you've got to understand Wireshark, 
uh, it's a fair amount to it. So there's a number of resources uh, out there. Um, there's just a few books uh, that I have. Um, I know the authors and work with them uh, various times as well. Uh, so I'm just gonna fly through these really quick. Uh, but there's a, a good amount of resources, even just past these specific books uh, on Wireshark. And I know uh, Laura Chapel, who has a number of books, who designed the initial certification and is releasing a new book this um, month. Uh, she just tweeted it uh, that she's got a new um, uh, uh, workbook coming out. And then she's got a prep guide for uh, uh, working towards that certification. So, in extremely uh, fast moving pace, that's kind of Wireshark basics. Uh, I hope there is a little bit of information uh, that you've seen and that you'll be able to review at a future point that's provided some value to you, uh, some things to perhaps get you thinking of and, and, your, and your endeavors of using Wireshark. And um, uh, there's always a lot of fun doing that. A little bit of contact info there about me. So let me go back to the first slide since that had the GitHub link just to make sure everybody gets that. Uh, like I say, we've got trace files up there already and I'll have the uh, presentation up so that you can do those little hands-on mini labs uh, uh, at your own point in time. So with that, uh, Ray, I guess I'll hand it back over to you. All right, does anybody have any questions? Uh, hi, Jeff. So I was wondering, what other tools do you frequently find yourself coupling with Wireshark? Uh, something like, like maybe Snort or anything that uh, you frequently work together with Wireshark and find work best to, uh, you know, define whatever network issues are going on? Well, while that is an awesome question, my answer is actually pretty dull. Um, <laughs> I don't really use many other tools for what I do, okay? Uh, but using some other type of a tool, like into a Snort, uh, I see a lot of folks may use Snort uh, output, especially from uh, log gathering, kind of in combination with Wireshark. A lot of times it's, especially if I have a trace and I have a maybe a range of time when an event occurred, perhaps I can find out better when the event occurred through like log information and then narrow down my Wireshark view uh, actually second you know, to that uh, or vice versa. Maybe I found some sort of an anomaly. Now let's go look at our logs uh, from like a snort or other type of, you know, I'm gonna call it a big log processing type system to do that same kind of thing. Well, what was going on on the network when I see the event at the packets, what else was going on? Because I may not be able to see all those things. There's just so much data. Um, and especially if I wasn't even focusing on log data that was coming from different components in the infrastructure. So there's, there are definitely a number of other utilities um, uh, in one of those uh, links at the end. Um, uh, the guy has another tool called NetMiner and it's kind of like a, a wire shark um, uh, processing. Uh, it gives a more in-depth kind of a, um, a decode analysis, not of the packet, but more of a summarization if you're looking for certain kinds of things. It's kind of like find the, the base level with say Wireshark and then feed it into another application. Uh, there's another tool that I use kind of as a sidebar, but semi-frequently called Trace Wrangler. And Trace Wrangler is a packet anonymizer. So specifically, if I'm working, say, on a customer site and I'm gathering traffic, um, they may not want their IP addresses or certain parts of packets, uh, especially if there's uh, any type of credentialing that's clear text, uh, to be provided outside of the house. Uh, maybe they need to send it to a vendor because they're trying to point to the vendor uh, problem, but they need to send that, tra that packet out, packet capture out, but they don't want to give that kind of information. So Trace Wrangler is just another awesome tool to file. Even if it's internal, you, you just may want to change the address for a particular reason, or maybe I don't want uh, it getting out what the external sites that I'm going to. So I can, I can anonymize those two 
you know, some other, we'll just say ten dot. Or if I'm a ten dot network, I can anonymize all those to a 192.168.1 uh, as opposed to the outside world address. So there's definitely those kinds of, you know, uh, uh, interrelated functions of being able to use. And there's a number of other utilities that are out there to, to kind of help, uh, even if you just use Wireshark to gather the traffic, uh, to effectively put it into a system for either playback, uh, which you can do playback in, in Wireshark of, of some protocols, um, uh, or I need to do a, a more heavy duty analysis than maybe even what Wireshark provides. Uh, like one of the playbacks is you can play back a phone call. If you can capture the phone call, you can play back the phone call uh, with Wireshark, which is actually just kind of cool stuff to see. Thank you. Pleasure. Does anybody else have any questions? All right, well, I want to thank you very much for joining us, Jeff. This is great. Uh, I'm going to put it up on YouTube so other people can watch it on our channel. Um, and with that, I will say good night to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank Have you. a good rest of your evening. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. My pleasure. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>